Section 32 of The Art of Letters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Grenholm. The Art of Letters by Robert Lind. Section 32. Roman 19. An American Critic. Professor Irving Babbitt. It is rather odd that two of the ablest American critics should also be two of the most unsparing enemies of romanticism in literature. Professor Babbitt and Mr. Paul Elmer Moore cannot get over the French Revolution. They seem to think that the rights of man have poisoned literature. One suspects that they have their doubts even about the American Revolution. For there, too, the rights of man were asserted against the lust of power. It is only fair to Professor Babbitt to say that he does not defend the lust of power. On the contrary, he damns it and explains it as the logical and almost inevitable outcome of the rights of man. The steps of the process by which the change is effected are these. First, we have the Rousseaus asserting that the natural man is essentially good, but that he has been depraved by an artificial social system imposed upon him from without. Instead of the quarrel between good and evil in his breast, they see only the quarrel between the innate good in man and his evil environment. They hold that all will be well if only he is set free, if his genius or natural impulses are liberated. Quote, Rousseauism is an emancipation of impulse, especially of the impulse of sex. Close quote. It is the gospel of egoism and leaves little room for conscience. Hence it makes men megalomaniacs, and the lust for dominion is given its head no less than the lust of the flesh. Quote, In the absence of ethical discipline, close quote, writes Professor Babbitt in Rousseau and Romanticism, Quote, the lust for knowledge and the lust for feeling count very little, at least practically, compared with the third main lust of human nature, the lust for power. Hence the emergence of that most sinister of all types, the efficient megalomaniac. Close quote. In the result, it appears that not only Rousseau and Hugo, but Wordsworth, Keats, and Shelley helped to bring about the European war. Had there been no wars, no tyrants, and no lascivious men before Rousseau, one would have been ready to take Professor Babbitt's indictment more seriously. Professor Babbitt, however, has a serious philosophic idea at the back of all he says. He believes that man at his noblest lives the life of obligation rather than of impulse, and that romantic literature discourages him in this. He holds that man should rise from the plane of nature to the plane of humanism or the plane of religion, and that to live according to one's temperament, as the romanticists preach, is to sink back from human nature, in the best sense, to animal nature. He takes the view that men of science since Bacon, by the great conquests they have made in the material sphere, have prepared man to take the romantic and boastful view of himself. Quote, if men had not been so heartened by scientific progress, they would have been less ready, we may be sure, to listen to Rousseau when he affirmed that they were naturally good. Close quote. Not that Professor Babbitt looks on us as utterly evil and worthy of damnation. He objects to the gloomy Jonathan Edwards view because it helps to precipitate by reaction the opposite extreme. Quote, the boundless sycophancy of human nature from which we are now suffering. Close quote. It was, perhaps, in reaction against the priests that Rousseau made the most boastful announcements of his righteousness. Quote, Rousseau feels himself so good that he is ready, as he declares, to appear before the Almighty at the sound of the trump of the Last Judgment with the book of his Confessions in his hand and there to issue a challenge to the whole human race. Let a single one assert to thee, if he dare, I am better than that man. Close quote. 
Rousseau would have been saved from this fustian virtue, Professor Babbitt thinks, if he had accepted either the classic or the religious view of life. For the classic view imposes on human nature the discipline of decorum, while the religious view imposes the discipline of humility. Human nature, he holds, requires the restrictions of the everlasting no. Virtue is a struggle within iron limitations, not an easy gush of feeling. At the same time, Professor Babbitt does not offer us as a cure for our troubles the decorum of the Pharisees and the pseudo-classicists who bid us obey outward rules instead of imitating a spirit. He wishes our men of letters to rediscover the ethical imagination of the Greeks. True classicism, he observes, Quote, does not rest on the observance of rules or the imitation of modes, but on an immediate insight into the universal. Close quote. The Romanticists, he thinks, cultivate not the awe we find in the great writers, but mere wonder. He takes Poe as a typical Romanticist. Quote, it is not easy to discover in either the personality or writings of Poe an atom of awe or reverence. On the other hand, he both experiences wonder and seeks in his art to be a pure wondersmith. Close quote. One of the results of putting wonder above awe is that the Romanticists unduly praise the ignorant, the savage, the peasant, and the child. Wordsworth here comes in for denunciation for having hailed a child of six as quote, mighty prophet seer blessed close quote. christ professor babbitt tells us praised the child not for its capacity for wonder but for its freedom from sin the romanticist on the other hand loves the spontaneous gush of wonder he loves daydreams arcadianism fairy tale utopianism he begins with an uncontrolled fancy and ends with an uncontrolled character he tries all sorts of false gods, nature worship, art worship, humanitarianism, sentimentalism about animals. As regards the last of these, romanticism, according to the author, has meant the rehabilitation of the ass, and the Rousseauists are guilty of onolatry. Quote, Medical men have given a learned name to the malady of those who neglect the members of their own family and gush over animals, paren zoophilopsychosis. Close paren. But Rousseau already exhibits this psychosis. He abandoned his five children one after the other, but had, we are told, an unspeakable affection for his dog. Close quote. As for the worship of nature, it leads to a wise passiveness instead of the wise energy of knowledge and virtue and tempts man to idle in pantheistic reveries. Quote, in Rousseau or Walt Whitman, it amounts to a sort of ecstatic animality that sets up as a divine illumination. Close quote. Professor Babbitt distrusts ecstasy as he distrusts Arcadianism. He perceives the moat of Arcadianism even in, quote, the light that never was on land or sea, close quote. He has no objection to a return to nature, if it is for purposes of recreation. He denounces it, however, when it is set up as a cult or, quote, a substitute for philosophy and religion, close quote. He denounces, indeed, every kind of, quote, painless substitute for genuine spiritual effort. Close quote. He admires the difficult virtues and holds that the gift of sympathy or pity or fraternity is in their absence hardly worth having. On points of this kind, I fancy, he would have had on his side Wordsworth, Coleridge, Browning, and many of the other Rousseauists whom he attacks. Professor Babbitt, however, is a merciless critic, and the writers of the 19th century who seem to most of us veritable monsters of ethics, are to him simply false prophets of romanticism and scientific complacency. The 19th century, he declares, 
quote, may very well prove to have been the most wonderful and the least wise of centuries, close quote. He admits the immense materialistic energy of the century, but this did not make up for the lack of a genuine philosophic insight in life and literature. Man is a morally indolent animal, and he was never more so than when he was working, quote, with something approaching frenzy according to the natural law. Close quote. Faced with the spectacle of a romantic spiritual sloth, accompanied by a materialistic, physical, and even intellectual energy, the author warns us that, quote, the discipline that helps a man to self-mastery is found to have a more important bearing on his happiness than the discipline that helps him to a mastery of physical nature, close quote. He sees a peril to our civilization in our absorption in the temporal and our failure to discover that something abiding on which civilization must rest. He quotes Aristotle's anti-romantic saying that, quote, most men would rather live in a disorderly than in a sober manner, close quote. He feels that in conduct, politics, and the arts, we have, as the saying is, plumped for the disorderly manner today. His book is a very useful challenge to the times, though it is a dangerous book to put in the hands of anyone inclined to conservatism. After all, Romanticism was a great liberating force. It liberated men not from decorum, but from pseudo-decorum, not from humility, but from subserviency. It may be admitted that without humility and decorum of the true kind, Liberty is only pseudo-liberty, equality only pseudo-equality, and fraternity only pseudo-fraternity. I am afraid, however, that in getting rid of the vices of Romanticism, Professor Babbitt would pour away the baby with the bathwater. Where Professor Babbitt goes wrong is in not realizing that Romanticism, with its emphasis on rights, is a necessary counterpart to Classicism, with its emphasis on duties. Each of them tries to do without the other. The most notorious Romantic lovers were men who failed to realize the necessity of fidelity, just as the minor Romantic artists today fail to realize the necessity of tradition. On the other hand, the classicist in excess prefers a world in which men preserve the decorum of servants to a world in which they might attain to the decorum of equals. Professor Babbitt refers to the pseudo-classical drama of 17th century France in which men confuse nobility of language with the language of the nobility. He himself, unfortunately, is not free from similar prejudices. He is antipathetic, so far as one can see, to any movement for a better social system than we already possess. He is definitely in reaction against the whole forward movement of the last two centuries. He has pointed out certain flaws in the moderns, but he has failed to appreciate their virtues. Literature today is less noble than the literature of Shakespeare, partly, I think, because men have lost the sense of sin. Without the sense of sin, we cannot have the greatest tragedy. The Greeks and Shakespeare perceived the contrast between the pure and the impure, the noble and the base, as no writer perceives it today. Romanticism undoubtedly led to a confusion of moral values. On the other hand, it was a necessary counterblast to formalism. In the great books of the world, in Isaiah and the Gospels, the best elements of both the classic and the romantic are found working together, in harmony. If Christ were living today, is Professor Babbitt quite sure that he himself would not have censured the anthophilopsychosis of Consider the Lilies of the Field? End of section 32. Recording by Gary Granholm. Section 33 of The Art of Letters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Grenholm. 
The Art of Letters by Robert Lind. Roman 20. Georgians. Arabic 1. Mr. de la Mer. Mr. Walter de la Mer gives us no Thames of song. His genius is scarcely more than a rill, but how the rill shines! How sweet a music it makes! Into what lands of romance does it flow, and beneath what hedges populous with birds? It seems at times as though it were a little fugitive stream attempting to run as far away as possible from the wilderness of reality and to lose itself in quiet, dreaming places. There never were shyer songs than these. Mr. de la Mer is at the opposite pole to poets so robustly at ease with experience as Browning and Whitman. He has no cheers or welcome for the laboring universe on its march. He is interested in the daily procession only because he seeks in it one face, one figure. He is lovesick for love, for beauty, and longs to save it from the contamination of the common world. Like the lover in The Tryst, he dreams always of a secret place of love and beauty set solitarily beyond the bounds of the time and space we know. Quote, Beyond the rumor even of paradise come, there, out of all remembrance, make our home. Seek we some close-hid shadow for our lair, hollowed by Noah's mouse, beneath the chair wherein the omnipotent, in slumber bound, nods till the piteous trump of judgment sound. Perchance Leviathan of the deep sea would lease a lost mermaiden's grot to me. There of your beauty we would joyance make, a music wistful for the sea-nymph's sake. Haply Elijah, or his spokes of fire, cresting steep Leo, or the heavenly lyre, spied, tranced in azure of inane space, some airy hostel, meet for human grace, where two might happy be, just you and I, lost in the uttermost of eternity. This is, no doubt, a far from rare mood in poetry. Even the waltz songs of the music halls express, or attempt to express, the longing of lovers for an impossible loneliness. Mr. de la Mer touches our hearts, however, not because he shares our sentimental daydreams, but because he so mournfully turns back from them to the bitterness of reality. Quote, no, no, nor earth, nor air, nor fire, nor deep could lull a poor mortal longingness asleep. Somewhere there nothing is, and there lost man shall win what changeless vague of peace he can. Close quote. These lines, peren, ending in an unsatisfactory and ineffective vagueness of phrase, which is Mr. de la Mer's peculiar vice as a poet, close paren. These lines suggest something of the sad philosophy which runs through the verse in Motley. The poems are, for the most part, praise of beauty, sought and found in the shadow of death, Melancholy though it is, however, Mr. de la Mer's book is, as we have said, a book of praise, not of lamentations. He triumphantly announces that, if he were to begin to write of earth's wonders, quote, flit would the ages on soundless wings, ere unto Z, my pen drew nigh, Leviathan told, and the honey fly, close quote. He cannot come upon a twittering linnet, a, quote, thing of light, close quote, in a bush without realizing that, quote, all the throbbing world of dew and sun and air by this small parcel of life is made more fair, close quote. He bids us in farewell, quote, look thy last on all things lovely every hour. Let no night seal thy sense in deathly slumber, till to delight thou have paid thy utmost blessing. Close quote. Thus, there is nothing faint hearted in Mr. de la Mer's melancholy. His sorrow is idealist's sorrow. He has the heart of a worshipper, a lover. 
we find evidence of this not least in his war verses at the outbreak of the war he evidently shared with other lovers and idealists the feeling of elation in the presence of noble sacrifices made for the world Quote, now each man's mind all europe is Close quote. he cries in the first line in happy england and as he remembers the peace of england quote, her woods and wilds her loveliness Close quote, he exclaims Quote, oh, what a deep, contented night the sun from out her eastern seas would bring the dust which, in her sight, had given it all for these. Close quote. So beautiful a spirit as Mr. de la Mare's, however, could not remain content with idealizing from afar the sacrifices and heroism of dying men. In the long poem called Motley, he turns from the heroism to the madness of war, translating his vision into a fool's song. Quote, Nay, but a dream I had of a world all mad, not simply happy mad like me, who am mad like an empty scene of water and willow tree where the wind hath been, but that foul Satan mad who rots in his own head. Close quote. The fool's vision of men going into battle is not a vision of knights of the Holy Ghost nobly falling in the lists with their country looking on, but of men's bodies, quote, dragging cold cannon through a mire of rain and blood and spouting fire, the new moon glinting hard on eyes wide with insanities, close quote. In the marionettes, Mr. de la Mer turns to tragic satire for relief from the bitterness of a war-maddened world. Quote, Let the foul scene proceed. There's laughter in the wings. Tis sawdust that they bleed, but a box death brings. How rare a skill is theirs, these extreme pangs to show. How real a frenzy wears each feigner of woe. Close quote. And the poem goes on in perplexity of anger and anguish. Quote, Strange, such a piece is free while we spectators sit aghast at its agony, yet absorbed in it. Dark is the outer air. Coldly the night draughts blow, mutely we stare and stare at the frenzied show. Yet heaven hath its quiet shroud of deep, immutable blue. We cry, The end! We are bowed by the dread. Tis true! While the shape who hoofs applause behind our deafened ear hoots angel wise the cause and affrights even fear Close quote. there is something in these lines that reminds one of mr thomas hardy's black-edged indictment of life as we read mr de la mer indeed we are reminded again and again of the work of many other poets of the ballad writers the elizabethan song writers blake and wordsworth mr hardy and mr w b yeats in some instances, it is as though Mr. de la Mer has deliberately set himself to compose a musical variation on the same theme as one of the older masters. Thus, April Moon, which contains the charming verse, The little moon that April brings, more lovely shade than light, that setting silvers lonely hills upon the verge of night. The verse is merely Wordsworth, quote, she dwelt among the untrodden ways, turned into new music. New music, we should say, is Mr. de la Mer's chief gift to literature, a music not regular or precise or certain, but nonetheless a music in which weak rhymes and even weak phrases are jangled into a strange beauty, as in Alexander, which begins, It was the great Alexander capped with a golden helm, sate in the ages in his floating ship in a dead calm one finds mr de la mer's characteristic unemphatic music 
again in the opening lines of Mrs. Grundy. Step very softly, sweet quiet foot. Stumble not, whisper not, smile not. Where foot and not are rhymes. It is the stream of music flowing through his verses, rather than any riches of imagery or phrase, that makes one rank the author so high among living poets. But music and verse can hardly be separated from intensity and sincerity of vision. This music of Mr. de la Mare's is not a mere craftsman's tune. It is an echo of the spirit. Had he not seen beautiful things passionately, Mr. de la Mare could never have written, Thou with thy cheek on mine, and dark hair loosed, shalt see, take the far stars for fruit, the cypress tree, and in the yew's black shall the moon be. Beautiful as Mr. de la Mare's vision is, however, and beautiful as is his music, we miss in his work that frequent perfection of phrase which is part of the genius of, to take another living writer, Mr. Yeats. One has only to compare Mr. Yeats' I heard the old, old men say with Mr. de la Mare's The Old Men to see how far the latter falls below verbal mastery. Mr. Yeats has found the perfect embodiment for his imagination. Mr. de la Mare seems, in comparison, to be struggling with his medium, and contrives in his first verse to be no more than just articulate. Old and alone sit we, caged, riddle-rid men, lost to earth's listen and see, thoughts wherefore and when. There is vision in some of the later verses in the poem, but if we read it alongside of Mr. Yeats, we get an impression of unsuccess of execution. Whether one can fairly use the word unsuccess in reference to verse which succeeds so exquisitely as Mr. de la Mare's in being literature is a nice question. But how else is one to define the peculiar quality of his style, its hesitations, its vagueness, its obscurities? On the other hand, even when his lines leave the intellect puzzled and the desire for grammar unsatisfied, a breath of original romance blows through them and appeals to us like the illogical burden of a ballad. Here, at least, are the rhythms and raptures of poetry, if not always the beaten gold of speech. Sometimes Mr. de la Mare's verse reminds one of piano music, sometimes of bird music, it wavers so curiously between what is composed and what is unsophisticated. Not that one ever doubts for a moment that Mr. de la Mare has spent on his work an artist's pains. He has made a craft out of his innocence. If he produces in his verse the effect of the wind among the reeds, it is the result not only of his artlessness, but of his art. He is one of the modern poets who have broken away from the metrical formalities of Swinburne and the older men, and who, of set purpose, have imposed upon poetry the beauty of a slightly irregular pulse. He is typical of his generation, however, not only in his form, but in the pain of his unbelief, paren, as shown in Betrayal, Close paren, and in that sense of half-revelation that fills him always with wonder and sometimes with hope. His poems tell of the visits of strange presences in dream and vacancy. In A Vacant Day, after describing the beauty of a summer moon with clear waters flowing under willows, he closes with the verses, I listened and my heart was dumb with praise no language could express, longing in vain for him to come who had breathed such blessedness. On this fair world, wherein we pass so checkered and so brief a stay, and yearned in spirit to learn, alas, what kept him still away. 
in these poems we have the genius of the beauty of gentleness expressing itself as it is doing nowhere else just now in verse mr de la mer's poetry is not only lovely but lovable he has a personal possession quote, the skill of words to sweeten despair close quote such as will we are confident give him a permanent place in english literature end of section 33 recording by gary grenholm section 34 of the art of letters this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Grenholm. The Art of Letters by Robert Lind. Roman 20, Georgians. Arabic 2, The Group. The latest collection of Georgian verse has had a mixed reception. One or two distinguished critics have written of it in the mood of a challenge to mortal combat. Men have begun to quarrel over the question whether we are living in an age of poetic dearth or of poetic plenty, whether the world is a nest of singing birds or a cage in which the last canary has been dead for several years. All this, I think, is a good sign. It means that poetry is interesting people sufficiently to make them wish to argue about it. Better a breeze, even a somewhat excessive breeze, than stagnant air. It is good both for poets and for the reading public. It prevents the poets from resting on their wings, as they might be tempted to do by a consistent calm of praise. It compels them to examine their work more critically. Anyhow, quote, fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil, close quote. And a reasonable amount of sharp censure will do a true poet more good than harm. It will not necessarily injure even his sales. I understand the latest volume of Georgian poetry is already in greater demand than its predecessor. It is a good anthology of the poetry of the last two years, without being an ideal anthology. Some good poets and some good poems have been omitted. And they have been omitted in some instances in favor of inferior works. Many of us would prefer an anthology of the best poems rather than an anthology of authors. At the same time, with all its faults, Georgian poetry still remains the best guide we possess to the poetic activities of the time. I am glad to see that the editor includes the work of a woman in his new volume. This helps to make it more representative than the previous selections. But there are several other living women who are better poets at the lowest estimate than at least a quarter of the men who have gained admission. Mr. W. H. Davies is by now a veteran among the Georgians, and one cannot easily imagine a presence more welcome in a book of verse. Among poets he is a bird singing in a hedge. He communicates the same sense of freshness while he sings. He has also the quick eye of a bird. He is, for all his fairy music, on the lookout for things that will gratify his appetite. He looks to the earth rather than the sky, though he is by no means deaf to the lark that, quote, raves in his windy heights above a cloud, close quote. At the same time, at his best, he says nothing about his appetite and sings in the free spirit of a child at play. His best poems are songs of innocence. At least, that is the predominant element in them. He warned the public in a recent book that he is not so innocent as he sounds. But his genius certainly is. He has written greater poems than any that are included in the present selection. Birds, however, is a beautiful example of his gift for joy. We need not fear for contemporary poetry while the hedges contain a poet such as Mr. Davies. Mr. de la Mer does not sing from a hedge. He is a child of the arts. He plays an instrument. His music is the music of a lute of which some of the strings have been broken. 
It is so extraordinarily sweet, indeed, that one has to explain him to oneself as the perfect master of an imperfect instrument. He is at times like Watts' figure of hope, listening to the faint music of the single string that remains unbroken. There is always some element of hope, or of some kindred excuse for joy, even in his deepest melancholy. But it is the joy of a spirit, not of a super-tramp. Prospero might have summoned just such a spirit through the air to make music for him. And Mr. de la Mare's is a spirit perceptible to the ear rather than to the eye. One need not count him the equal of Campion in order to feel that he has something of Campion's beautiful genius for making airs out of words. He has little enough of the Keatsian genius for choosing the word that has the most meaning for the seeing imagination. But there is a secret melody in his words that, when once one has recognized it, one can never forget. How different the Georgian poets are from each other may be seen if we compare three of the best poems in this book, all of them on similar subjects. Mr. Davies' Birds, Mr. de la Mare's Linnet, and Mr. Squire's Birds. Mr. Squire would feel as out of place in a hedge as would Mr. de la Mare. He has an aquiline love of soaring and surveying immense tracks with keen eyes. He loves to explore both time and the map, but he does this without losing his eyehold on the details of the Noah's Ark of life on the earth beneath him. He does not lose himself in vaporous abstraction. His eye, as well as his mind, is extraordinarily interesting. This poem of his, Birds, is peopled with birds. We see them in flight and in their nests. At the same time, the philosophic wonder of Mr. Squire's poem separates him from Mr. Davies and Mr. de la Mare. Mr. Davies, I fancy, loves most to look at birds. Mr. de la Mare to listen to birds. Mr. Squire to brood over them with the philosophic imagination. It would, of course, be absurd to offer this as a final statement of the poetic attitude of the three writers. It is merely an attempt to differentiate among them with the help of a prominent characteristic of each. The other poets in the collection include Mr. Robert Graves, with his pleasant bias toward nursery rhymes, Mr. Sassoon, with his sensitive, passionate satire, and Mr. Edward Shanks, with his trembling responsiveness to beauty. It is the first time that Mr. Shanks appears among the Georgians, and his Night Piece and Glowworm both show how exquisite is his sensibility. He differs from the other poets by his quasi-analytic method. He seems to be analyzing the beauty of the evening in both these poems. Mrs. Shove's A Man Dreams That He Is the Creator is a charming example of fancy toying with a great theme. End of section 34. Recording by Gary Grenholm. Section 35 of The Art of Letters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Grenholm. The Art of Letters by Robert Lind. Roman 20, Georgians. Arabic 3, The Young Satirists. Satire, it has been said, is an ignoble art, and it is probable that there are no satirists in heaven. Probably there are no doctors, either. Satire and medicine are our responses to a diseased world, to our diseased selves. They are responses, however, that make for health. Satire holds the medicine glass up to human nature. It also holds the mirror up in a limited way. It does not show a man what he looks like when he is both well and good. It does show a man what he looks like, however, when he breaks out into spots or goes yellow, pale, or mottled as a result of making a beast of himself. 
it reflects only sick men but it reflects them with a purpose it would be a crime to permit it if the world were a hospital for incurables to write satire is an act of faith not a luxurious exercise the despairing swift was a fighter as the despairing anatole france is a fighter they may have uttered the very z of melancholy about the animal called man but at least they were sufficiently optimistic to write satires and to throw themselves into defeated causes it would be too much to expect of satire that it alone will cure mankind of the disease of war it is a good sign however that satires on war have begun to be written war has affected with horror or disgust a number of great imaginative writers in the last two or three thousand years the tragic indictment of war in the trojan women and the satiric indictment in the voyage to the hinhinums are evidence that some men at least saw through the romance of war before the twentieth century in the war that has just ended however or that would have ended if the peace conference would let it we have seen an imaginative revolt against war not on the part of mere men of letters but on the part of soldiers ballads have survived from other wars depicting the plight of the mutilated soldier left to beg you haven't an arm and you haven't a leg you're an eyeless noseless chickenless egg you ought to be put in a bowl to beg oh johnny i hardly knew you but the recent war has produced a literature of indictment basing itself neither on the woes of women nor on the wrongs of ex-soldiers but on the right of common men not to be forced into mutual murder by statesmen who themselves never killed anything more formidable than a pheasant soldiers or some of them see that wars go on only because the people who cause them do not realize what war is like i do not mean to suggest that the kings statesmen and journalists who bring wars about would not themselves take part in the fighting rather than that there should be no fighting at all the people who cause wars however are ultimately the people who endure kings statesmen and journalists of the exploiting and bullying kind the satire of the soldiers is an appeal not to the statesmen and journalists but to the general imagination of mankind it is an attempt to drag our imaginations away from the heroics of the senate house into the filth of the slaughterhouse it does not deny the heroism that exists in the slaughterhouse any more than it denies the heroism that exists in the hospital ward but it protests that just as the heroism of a man dying of cancer must not be taken to justify cancer so the heroism of a million men dying of war must not be taken to justify war there are some who believe that neither war nor cancer is a curable disease one thing we can be sure of in this connection we shall never get rid either of war or of cancer if we do not learn to look at them realistically and see how loathsome they are so long as war was regarded as inevitable the poet was justified in romanticizing it as in that epigram in the greek anthology quote, "Demetia sent eight sons to encounter the phalanx of the foe and she buried them all beneath one stone no tear did she shed in her mourning but said this only ho sparta i bore these children for thee Close quote. as soon as it is realized however that wars are not inevitable men cease to idealize demetia unless they are sure she did her best to keep the peace to a realistic poet of war such as mr sassoon she is an object of pity rather than praise his sonnet glory of women suggests that there is another point of view besides demetia's you love us when we're heroes home on leave or wounded in a mentionable place you worship decorations you believe that chivalry redeems the war's disgrace you make us shells you listen with delight by tales of dirt and danger fondly thrilled 
you crown our distant ardors while we fight and mourn our laurelled memories when we're killed you can't believe that british troops retire when hell's last horror breaks them and they run trampling the terrible corpses blind with blood o oh, german mother dreaming by the fire while you are knitting socks to send your son his face is trodden deeper in the mud Close quote. to mr sassoon and the other war satirists indeed those who stay at home and incite others to go out and kill or get killed seem either pitifully stupid or pervertedly criminal mr sassoon has now collected all his war poems into one volume and one is struck by the energetic hatred of those who make war and safety that finds expression in them most readers will remember the bitter joy of the dream that one day he might hear quote, the yellow pressman grunt and squeal close quote, and see the junkers driven out of parliament by the returned soldiers mr sassoon cannot endure the enthusiasm of the stay-at-home especially the enthusiasm that pretends that soldiers not only behave like music-hall clowns but are incapable of the more terrible emotional experiences he would like i fancy to forbid civilians to make jokes during wartime his hatred of the jesting civilian attains passionate expression in the poem called blighters the house is crammed tear beyond tear they grin and cackle at the show while prancing ranks of harlots shrill the chorus drunk with din we're sure the kaiser loves the dear old tanks i'd like to see a tank come down the stalls lurching to ragtime tunes or home sweet home and there'd be no more jokes in music halls to mock the riddled corpses round the poem Close quote. Mr. Sassoon himself laughs on occasion, but it is the laughter of a man being driven insane by an insane world. The spectacle of lives being thrown away by the hundred thousand, by statesmen and generals, without the capacity to run a village flower show, makes him find relief now and then in a hysteria of mirth, as in the general. Good morning, good morning, the general said when we met him last week on our way to the line now the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead and were cursing his staff for incompetent swine he's a cheery old card grunted harry to jack as they slogged up to arras with rifle and pack but he did for them both by his plan of attack Close quote. Mr. Sassoon's verse is also of importance because it paints life in the trenches with a realism not to be found elsewhere in the English poetry of the war. He spares us nothing of, quote, the strangled horror and butchered frantic gestures of the dead, close quote. He gives us every detail of the filth, the dullness, and the agony of the trenches. His book is, in its aim, destructive. It is a great pamphlet against war. If posterity wishes to know what war was like during this period, it will discover the truth not in barrack room ballads, but in Mr. Sassoon's verse. The best poems in the book are poems of hatred. This means that Mr. Sassoon has still other worlds to conquer in poetry. His poems have not the constructive ardor that we find in the revolutionary poems of Shelley. They are utterances of pain rather than of vision. Many of them, however, rise to a noble pity. The prelude, for instance, and aftermath, the latter of which ends, quote, Do you remember the dark months you held the sector at Mametz, the night you watched and wired and dug? and piled sandbags on the parapets? Do you remember the rats and the stench of corpses rotting in front of the front-line trench, and dawn coming, dirty white, and chill with a hopeless rain? Do you ever stop and ask, is it all going to happen again? Do you remember that hour of din before the attack, and the anger, the blind compassion that seized and shook you then, 
as you peered at the doomed and haggard faces of your men do you remember the stretcher cases lurching back with dying eyes and lolling heads those ashen gray masks of the lads who once were keen and kind and gay have you forgotten yet look up and swear by the green of the spring that you'll never forget Close quote. mr sitwell's satires which occupy the most interesting pages of argonaut and juggernaut seldom take us into the trenches mr sitwell gets all the subjects he wants in london clubs and drawing rooms these free verse satires do not lend themselves readily to quotation but both the manner and the mood of them can be guessed from the closing verses of war horses in which the septuagenarian butterflies of society return to their platitudes and parties after seeing the war through Quote, but now they have come out they have preened and dried themselves after their blood bath old men seem a little younger and tortoise-shell combs are longer than ever earrings weigh down aged ears and golconda has given them of its best they have seen it through theirs is the triumph and beneath the carved smile of the mona lisa false teeth rattle like machine guns in anticipation of food and platitudes la vieille dame sans merci mr sitwell's hatred of war is seldom touched with pity it is arrogant hatred there is little emotion in it but that of a young man at war with age he pictures the dotards of two thousand years ago complaining that christ did not die quote, like a hero with an oath on his lips or the refrain from a comic song or a cheerful comment of some kind Close quote. His own verse, however, seems to me to be hardly more in sympathy with the spirit of Christ than with the spirit of those who mocked him. He is moved to write by unbelief in the ideals of other people rather than by the passionate force of ideals of his own. He is a skeptic, not a sufferer. His work proceeds less from his heart than from his brain. It is a clever brain, however, and his satirical poems are harshly entertaining and will infuriate the right people. They may not kill Goliath, but at least they will annoy Goliath's friends. David's weapon, it should be remembered, was a sling with some pebbles from the brook, not a pea-shooter. The truth is, so far as I can see, Mr. Sitwell has not begun to take poetry quite seriously. His non-satirical verse is full of bright color, but it has the brightness not of the fields and the flowers, but of captive birds in an aviary. It is as though Mr. Sitwell has taken poetry for his hobby. I suspect his argonauts of being ballet dancers. He enjoys amusing little decorations, phrases such as, quote, concertina waves, close quote, and, quote, the ocean at a toy shore yaps like a Pekingese. Close quote. His moonlit owl is surely a pretty creature from the unreality of a ballet. Quote, An owl, horned wizard of the night, flaps through the air so soft and still, moaning its wings in flight far from the forest cool, to find the star entangled surface of a pool where it may drink its fill of stars. Close quote. At the same time, here and there are evidences that Mr. Sitwell has felt as well as fancied. The opening verse of Pierrot Old gives us a real impression of shadows. Quote, the harvest moon is at its height. The evening primrose greets its light with grace and joy then opens up the mimic moon within its cup. Tall trees as high as Babel Tower throw down their shadows to the flower. Shadows that shiver seem to see an ending to infinity. But there is too much of Pan, the Fauns, and all those other ballet dancers in his verse. Mr. Sitwell's muse wears some pretty costumes, 
but one wonders when she will begin to live for something besides clothes. End of section 35. Recording by Gary Grenholm. Section 36 of The Art of Letters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. The Art of Letters by Robert Lind. Labor of Authorship. Literature maintains an endless quarrel with idle sentences. Twenty years ago, this would have seemed too obvious to bear saying. But in the meantime, there has been a good deal of dipping of pens in chaos, and authors have found excuses for themselves in a theory of literature which is impatient of difficult writing. It would not matter if it were only the paunched and flat-footed authors who were proclaiming the importance of writing without style. Unhappily, many excellent writers as well have used their gift of style to publish the praise of stylelessness. Within the last few weeks, I have seen it suggested by two different critics that the hasty writing which has left its mark on so much of the work of Scott and Balzac was a good thing and almost a necessity of genius. It is no longer taken for granted, as it was in the days of Stevenson, that the starry word is worth the pains of discovery. Stevenson, indeed, is commonly dismissed as a pretty, pretty writer, a word taster without intellect or passion a juggler rather than an artist. Pater's bust also is mutilated by irreverent schoolboys. It is hinted that he may have done well enough for the days of Victoria, but that he will not do at all for the world of George. It is all part of the reaction against style, which took place when everybody found out the aesthetes. It was, one may admit, an excellent thing to get rid of the aesthetes, but it was by no means an excellent thing to get rid of the virtue which they tried to bring into English art and literature. The aesthetes were wrong in almost everything they said about art and literature, but they were right in impressing upon the children of men the duty of good drawing and good words. With the condemnation of Oscar Wilde, however, good words become suspected of kinship with evil deeds. Style was looked on as the sign of minor poets and major vices. Possibly, on the other hand, the reaction against style had nothing to do with the wild condemnation. The heresy of the stylelessness is considerably older than that. Perhaps it is not quite fair to call it the heresy of stylelessness. It would be more accurate to describe it as the heresy of style without pains. It springs from the idea that great literature is all a matter of first fine, careless raptures, and it is supported by the fact that apparently much of the greatest literature is so. If lines like, Hark, hark, the lark at heaven's gate sings, or When daffodils begin to peer, or His golden locks time hath to silver turned, shape themselves in the poet's first thoughts, he would be a manifest fool to trouble himself further. Genius is the recognition of the perfect line, the perfect phrase, the perfect word, when it appears, and this perfect line or phrase or word is quite as likely to appear in the twinkling of an eye as after a week of vigils. But the point is that it does not invariably so appear. It sometimes cost Flaubert three days' labor to write one perfect sentence. Greater writers have written more hurriedly, but this does not justify lesser writers in writing hurriedly, too. Of all the authors who have exalted the part played in literature by inspiration as compared with labor, none has written more nobly or with better warrant than Shelley. The mind, he wrote in the defense of poetry, the mind in creation is as a fading coal which some invisible influence, like an inconstant wind, awakens to transitory brightness. The power arises from within, like the color of a flower which fades and changes as it is developed, and the conscious portions of our natures are unprophetic, either of its approach or its departure. Could this influence be durable in its original purity and force? It is impossible to predict the greatness of the results. But when composition begins, inspiration is already on the decline, and the most glorious poetry that has ever been communicated to the world is probably a feeble shadow of the original conceptions of the poet. 
I appeal to the greatest poets of the present day whether it is not an error to assert that the finest passages of poetry are produced by labor and study. He then goes on to interpret literally Milton's reference to Paradise Lost as an unpremeditated song dictated by the muse, and to reply scornfully to those who would allege the 56 various readings of the first line of the Orlando Furioso. Who is there who would not agree with Shelley quickly if it were a question of having to choose between his inspirational theory of literature and the mechanical theory of the arts advocated by writers like Sir Joshua Reynolds? Literature without inspiration is obviously even a meaner thing than literature without style. But the idea that any man can become an artist by taking pains is merely an exaggerated protest against the idea that a man can become an artist without taking pains. Anthony Trollope, who settled down industriously to his day's task of literature as to bookkeeping, did not grow into an artist in any large sense. And Zola, with the motto, Nulla dies sine linea, ever facing him on his desk, made himself a prodigious author indeed, but never more than a second-rate writer. On the other hand, Trollope without industry would have been nobody at all, and Zola without pains might as well have been a waiter. Nor is it only the little or the clumsy artists who have found inspiration in labor. It is a pity we have not first drafts of all the great poems in the world. We might then see how much of the magic of literature is the result of toil and how much of the unprophesied wind of inspiration. Sir Sidney Colvin recently published an early draft of Keats's sonnet, Bright Star Would I Were Steadfast As Thou Art, which showed that in the case of Keats at least, the mind in creation was not as a fading coal, but as a coal blown to increasing flame and splendor by sheer labor and study. And the poetry of Keats is full of examples of the inspiration not of first but of second and later thoughts. Henry Stevens, a medical student who lived with him for a time, declared that an early draft of Endymion opened with the line, A thing of beauty is a constant joy. A line which Stevens observed on hearing it was a fine line, but wanting something. Keats thought over it for a little, then cried out, I have it, and wrote in its place, A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Nor is this an exceptional example of the studied miracles of Keats, the most famous, and worn and cheapened by quotation though it is, the most beautiful of all his phrases. Magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Did not reach its perfect shape without hesitation and thinking. He originally wrote the wide casements and keelless seas. The wide casements opening on the foam of keelless seas in fairy lands forlorn. That would probably have seemed beautiful if the perfect version had not spoiled it for us. But does not the final version go to prove that Shelley's assertion that when composition begins, inspiration is already on the decline, does not hold good for all poets? On the contrary, it is often the heat of labor which produces the heat of inspiration, or rather it is often the heat of labor which enables the writer to recall the heat of inspiration. Ben Jonson, who held justly that the poet must be able by nature and instinct to pour out the treasure of his mind, took care to add the warning that no one must think he can leap forth suddenly a poet by dreaming he hath been in Parnassus. Poe has uttered a comparable warning against an excessive belief in the theory of the plenary inspiration of poets in his marginalia, where he declares that this untenable and paradoxical idea of the incompatibility of genius and art must be kicked out of the world's way. Wordsworth saying that poetry has its origin in emotion recollected in tranquility also suggests that the inspiration of poetry is an inspiration that may be recaptured by contemplation and labor. How eagerly one would study a Shakespeare manuscript were it unearthed in which one could see the shaping imagination of the poet at work upon his lines. Many people have the theory, it is supported by an assertion of Johnson's, that Shakespeare wrote with a current pen, heedless of blots and little changes. He was, it is evident, not one of the correct authors. 
but it seems unlikely that no pains of rewriting went into the making of the speeches in a midsummer night's dream or hamlet's address to the skull shakespeare one feels is richer than any other author in the beauty of first thoughts but one seems to perceive in much of his work the beauty of second thoughts too there have been few great writers who have been so incapable of revision as robert browning but browning with all his genius is not a great stylist to be named with shakespeare he did indeed prove himself to be a great stylist in more than one poem such as child roland which he wrote almost at a sitting his inspiration however seldom raised his work to the same beauty of perfection he is as regards mere style the most imperfect of the great poets if only tennyson had had his genius if only browning had had tennyson's desire for golden words it would be absurd however to suggest that the main labor of an author consists in rewriting the choice of words may have been made before a single one of them has been written down as tradition tells us was the case with menander who described one of his plays as finished before he had written a word of it it would be foolish too to write as though perfection of form in literature were merely a matter of picking and choosing among decorative words style is a method not of decoration but of expression it is an attempt to make the beauty and energy of the imagination articulate it is not any more than is construction the essence of the greatest art it is however a prerequisite of the greatest art even those writers whom we regard as the least decorative labor and sorrow after it no less than the aesthetes we who do not know russian do not usually think of tolstoy as a stylist but he took far more trouble with his writing than did oscar wilde whose chief fault is indeed that in spite of his theories his style is not labored and artistic but inspirational and indolent count Ilya tolstoy the son of the novelist published a volume of reminiscences of his father last year in which he gave some interesting particulars of his father's energetic struggle for perfection in writing when anna karenina began to come out in the ruski vestnik he wrote long galley proofs were posted to my father and he looked them through and corrected them at first the margins would be marked with the ordinary typographical signs letters omitted marks of punctuation and so on then individual words would be changed and then whole sentences erasures and additions would begin till in the end the proof sheet would be reduced to a mass of patches quite black in places and it was quite impossible to send it back as it stood because no one but my mother could make head or tail of the tangle of conventional signs transpositions and erasures my mother would sit up all night copying the whole thing out fresh in the morning there lay the pages on her table neatly piled together covered all over with her fine clear handwriting and everything ready so that when Lyovotchka came down he could send the proof sheets out by post my father would carry them off to his study to have just one last look and by the evening it was worse than before the whole thing had been rewritten and messed up once more sonya my dear i'm so very sorry but i've spoilt all your work again i promise i won't do it any more he would say showing her the passages with a guilty air we'll send them off tomorrow without fail but his tomorrow was put off day by day for weeks or months together there's just one bit i want to look through again my father would say but he would get carried away and rewrite the whole thing afresh there were even occasions when after posting the proofs my father would remember some particular words next day and correct them by telegraph there better than in a thousand generalizations you see what the artistic conscience is in a world in which authors like solicitors must live it is of course seldom possible to take pains in this measure dostoevsky used to groan that his poverty left him no time or chance to write his best as tolstoy and turgenev could write theirs but he at least labored all that he could novel writing has since his time become as painless as dentistry and the result may be seen in a host of books that while affecting to be fine literature have no price except as merchandise end of section 36
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Art of Letters by Robert Lind. Chapter 22 The Theory of Poetry. Matthew Arnold once advised people who wanted to know what was good poetry not to trouble themselves with definitions of poetry, but to learn by heart passages or even single lines from the works of the great poets, and to apply these as touchstones. Certainly a book like Mr. Cowell's Theory of Poetry in England, which aims at giving us a representative selection of the theoretical things which were said in England about poetry, between the time of Elizabeth and the time of Victoria, makes one wonder at the barrenness of men's thoughts about so fruitful a world as that of the poets. Mr. Cowell's book is not intended to be read as an anthology of fine things. Its value is not that of a book of golden thoughts. It is an ordered selection of documents chosen, not for their beauty, but simply for their use as milestones in the progress of English poetic theory. It is a work not of literature, but of literary history, and students of literary history are under a deep debt of gratitude to the author for bringing together and arranging the documents of the subject in so convenient and lucid a form. The arrangement is under subjects and chronological, there are 41 pages on the theory of poetic creation, beginning with George Gascoigne and ending with Matthew Arnold. These are followed by a few pages of representative passages about poetry as an imitative art, the first of the authors quoted being Roger Ascombe, and the last F. W. H. Myers. The book is divided into 12 sections of this kind, some of which have a tendency to overlap. Thus, in addition to the section on poetry as an imitative art, we have a section on imitation of nature, another on external nature, and another on imitation. Imitation, in the last of these, it is true, means for the most part imitation of the ancients, as in the sentence in which Thomas Reimer urged the 17th century dramatists to imitate Attic tragedy, even to the point of introducing the chorus. Mr. Cowell's book is interesting, however, less on account of the sections and subsections into which it is divided, than because of the manner in which it enables us to follow the flight of English poetry, from the Romanticism of the Elizabethans to the Neoclassicism of the 18th century and from this on to the romanticism of Wordsworth and Coleridge, and from this to a newer neoclassicism whose prophet was Matthew Arnold. There is not much of poetry captured in these cold-blooded criticisms, but still the shadow of the poetry of his time occasionally falls on the critics' formulae and aphorisms. How excellently Sir William Sidney expresses the truth that the poet does not imitate the world, but creates a world, in his observation that nature's world is brazen. The poets only deliver a golden. This, however, is a fine saying rather than an interpretation. It has no importance as a contribution to the theory of poetry to compare with a passage like that so often quoted from Wordsworth's preface to Lyrical Ballads. I have said that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotions recollected in tranquility. The emotion is contemplated till, by a species of reaction, the tranquility gradually disappears and an emotion kindred to that which was before the subject of contemplation is gradually produced, and does itself actually exist in the mind. 
as a theory of poetic creation. This may not apply universally. But what a flood of light it throws on the creative genius of Wordsworth himself. How rich in psychological insight it is, for instance, compared with Dryden's comparable reference to the part played by the memory in poetry. The composition of all poems is, or ought to be, of wit. And wit, in the poet, is no other than the faculty of imagination in the writer, which, like a nimble spaniel, beats over and ranges through the field of memory till it springs the quarry it hunted after. As a matter of fact, few of these generalizations carry one far. Ben Jonson revealed more of the secret of poetry when he said simply, It utters somewhat above a mortal mouth. So did Edgar Allan Poe when he said, It is no mere appreciation of the beauty before us, but a wild effort to reach the beauty above. Coleridge, again, initiates us into the secrets of the poetic imagination when he speaks of it as something which, combining many circumstances into one moment of consciousness, tends to produce that ultimate end of all human thought and human feeling, unity, and thereby the reduction of the spirit to its principle and fountain, which is alone truly one. On the other hand, the most dreadful thing that was ever written about poetry was also written by Coleridge, and is repeated in Mr. Cowell's book. How excellently the German Einbildungskraft expresses this prime and loftiest faculty, the power of coagination, the faculty that forms the many into one. In Einbildung, Isenoplasy, or essenoplastic power is contradistinguished from fantasy, either catoptric or metoptric, repeating simply or by transposition, and again involuntary fantasy as in dreams or by an act of the will. The meaning is simple enough. It is much the same as that of the preceding paragraph, but was there ever a passage written suggesting more forcibly how much easier it is to explain poetry by writing it than by writing about it? Mr. Cowell's book makes it clear that fiercely as the critics may dispute about poetry, they are practically all agreed on at least one point, that it is an imitation. The schools have differed less over the question whether it is an imitation than over the question how, in a discussion on the nature of poetry, the word imitation must be qualified. Obviously, the poet must imitate something, either what he sees in nature, or what he sees in memory, or what he sees in other poets, or what he sees in his soul, or it may be altogether. There arise schools every now and then, classicists, Parnassians, realists, and so forth, who believe in imitation, but will not allow it to be a free imitation of things seen in the imaginative world. In the result, their work is no true imitation of life. Pope's poetry is not as true an imitation of life as Shakespeare's, nor is Zola's for all its fidelity, as close an imitation of life as Victor Hugo's. Poetry, or prose either, without romance, without liberation, can never rise above the second order. The poet must be faithful, not only to his subject, but to his soul. Poe defined art as the reproduction of what the senses perceive in nature through the veil of the soul. And this, though like most definitions of art, incomplete, is true in so far as it reminds us that art at its greatest is the statement of a personal and ideal vision. 
That is why the reverence of rules and the arts is so dangerous. It puts the standards of poetry not in the hands of the poet, but in the hands of the grammarians. It is a Procrustes bed which mutilates the poet's vision. Luckily, England has always been a rather lawless country, and we find even Pope insisting that to judge of Shakespeare by Aristotle's rules is like trying a man by the laws of one country who acted under those of another. Dennis might cry, Poetry is either an art or whimsy and fanaticism. The great design of the arts is to restore the decays that happen to human nature by the fall, by restoring order. But, on the whole, the English poets and critics have realized the truth that it is not an order imposed from without, but an order imposed from within, at which the poet must aim. He aims at bringing order into chaos. But that does not mean that he aims at bringing Aristotle into chaos. He is, in a sense, beyond good and evil, so far as the orthodoxies of form are concerned. Coleridge put the matter in a nutshell when he remarked that the mistake of the formal critics who condemned Shakespeare as a sort of African nature, rich in beautiful monsters, lay in the confounding mechanical regularity with organic form. And he states the whole duty of poets as regards form in another sentence in the same lecture. As it must not, so genius cannot be lawless. For it is even this that constitutes its genius, the power of acting creatively under laws of its own origination. Mr. Cowell enables us to follow, as in no other book we know, the endless quarrel between romance and the rules, between the spirit and the letter among the English authorities on poetry. It is a quarrel which will obviously never be finally settled in any country. The mechanical theory is a necessary reaction against romance that has decayed into windiness, extravagance, and incoherence. It brings the poets back to literature again. The romantic theory, on the other hand, is necessary as a reminder that the poet must offer to the world not a formula, but a vision. It brings the poets back to nature again. No one but a Dennis will hesitate an instant in deciding which of the theories is the more importantly and eternally true one. End of Section 37 Recording by The Story Girl Section 38 of The Art of Letters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D. Randall. The Art of Letters by Robert Lind. The Critic as Destroyer. It has been said often enough that all good criticism is praise. Pater boldly called one of his volumes of critical essays appreciations. There are, of course, not a few brilliant instances of hostility in criticism. The best known of these in English is Macaulay's essay on Robert Montgomery. In recent years, we have witnessed the much more significant assault by Tolstoy upon almost the whole army of the authors of the civilized world, from Aeschylus down to Mallarmé. What is Art was unquestionably the most remarkable piece of sustained hostile criticism that was ever written. At the same time, it was less a denunciation of individual authors than an attack on the general tendencies of the literary art. 
Tolstoy quarreled with Shakespeare not so much for being Shakespeare as for failing to write like the authors of the Gospels. Tolstoy would have made every book a Bible. He raged against men of letters because with them literature was a means not to more abundant life, but to more abundant luxury. Like so many inexorable moralists, he was intolerant of all literature that did not serve as a sort of example of his own moral and social theories. That is why he was not a great critic, though he was immeasurably greater than a great critic. One would not turn to him for the perfect appreciation, even of one of the authors he spared, like Hugo or Dickens. The good critic must in some way begin by accepting literature as it is, just as the good lyric poet must begin by accepting life as it is. He may be as full of revolutionary and reforming theories as he likes, but he must not allow any of these to come like a cloud between him and the sun, moon, and stars of literature. The man who disparages the beauty of flowers and birds and love and laughter and courage will never be counted among the lyric poets, and the man who questions the beauty of the inhabited world the imaginative writers have made, a world as unreasonable in its loveliness as the world of nature, is not in the way of becoming a critic of literature. Another argument which tells in favor of the theory that the best criticism is praise is the fact that almost all the memorable examples of critical folly have been denunciations. One remembers that Carlyle dismissed Herbert Spencer as a never-ending ass. One remembers that Byron thought nothing of Keats, Jack Ketch, as he called him. One remembers that the critics damn Wagner's opera as a new form of sin. One remembers that Ruskin denounced one of Whistler's nocturnes as a pot of paint flung in the face of the British public. In the world of science, we have a thousand similar examples of new genius being held by the critics as folly and charlatanry. Only the other day, a biographer of Lord Lister was reminding us how, at the British Association in 1869, Lister's antiseptic treatment was attacked as a return to the dark ages of surgery, the carbolic mania, and a professional criminality. The history of science, art, music, and literature is strewn with the wrecks of such hostile criticisms. It is an appalling spectacle for anyone interested in asserting the intelligence of the human race. So appalling is it, indeed, that most of us nowadays labor under such a terror of accidentally condemning something good that we have not the courage to condemn anything at all. We think of the way in which Browning was once taunted for his obscurity, and we cannot find it in our hearts to censor Mr. Dowdy. We recall the ignorant attacks on Minet and Monet, and we will not risk an onslaught on the follies of Picasso and the worse than Picasso's of contemporary art. We grow a monstrous and unhealthy plant of tolerance in our souls, and its branches drop colorless good words on the just and on the unjust, on everybody indeed, except Miss Marie Corelli, Mr. Hall Kane, and a few others whom we know to be second-rate because they have such big circulations. This is really a disastrous state of affairs for literature and the other arts. If criticism is, generally speaking, praise, it is more definitely praise of the right things. Praise for the sake of praise is as great an evil as blame for the sake of blame. Indiscriminate praise, in so far as it is the result of distrust of one's own judgment or of laziness or of insincerity, is one of the deadly sins in criticism. It is also one of the deadly dull sins. Its effect is to make criticism ever more unreadable. And in the end, even the publishers who love silly sentences to quote about their bad books, will open their eyes to the futility of it. They will realize that when once criticism has become unreal and unreadable, people will no more be bothered with it 
than they will with drinking lukewarm water. I mention the publisher in especial because there is no doubt that it is with the idea of putting the publishers in a good, open-handed humor that so many papers and reviews have turned criticism into a kind of stagnant pond. Publishers, fortunately, are coming more and more to see that this kind of criticism is of no use to them. Reviews in such and such a paper, they will tell you, do not sell books. And the papers to which they refer in such cases are always papers in which praise is disgustingly served out to everybody, like spoonfuls of treacle and brimstone to a mob of schoolchildren. Criticism, then, is praise, but it is praise of literature. There is all the difference in the world between that and the praise of what pretends to be literature. True criticism is a search for beauty and truth and an announcement of them. It does not care two pence whether the method of their revelation is new or old, academic or futuristic. It only asks that the revelation shall be genuine. It is concerned with form because beauty and truth demand perfect expression. But it is a mere heresy in aesthetics to say that perfect expression is the whole of art that matters. It is the spirit that breaks through the form that is the main interest of criticism. Form, we know, has a permanence of its own, so much so that it has again and again been worshipped by the adulterers of art as being in itself more enduring than the thing which it embodies. Robert Burns, by his genius for perfect statement, can give immortality to the joys of being drunk with whiskey as the average hymn writer cannot give immortality to the joys of being drunk with the love of God. Style, then, does seem actually to be a form of life. The critic may not ignore it any more than he may exaggerate its place in the arts. As a matter of fact, he could not ignore it if he would, for style and spirit have a way of corresponding to one another like health and sunlight. It is to combat the stylelessness of many contemporary writers that the destructive kind of criticism is just now most necessary. For dangerous as the heresy of style was 40 or 50 years ago, the newer heresy of stylelessness is more dangerous still. It has become the custom even of men who write well to be as ashamed of their style as a schoolboy is of being caught in an obvious piece of goodness. They keep silent about it as though it were a kind of powdering or painting. They do not realize that it is merely a form of ordinary truthfulness, the truthfulness of the word about the thought. They forget that one has no more right to misuse words than to beat one's wife. Someone has said that in the last analysis, style is a moral quality. It is a sincerity a refusal to bow the knee to the superficial, a passion for justice in language. Stylelessness, where it is not, like color blindness, an accident of nature, is for the most part merely an echo of the commercial man's world of hustle. It is like the rushing to and fro of motor buses, which save minutes with great loss of life. It is like the swift making of furniture with unseasoned wood. It is a kind of introduction of the quick lunch system into literature. One cannot altogether acquit Mr. Maysfield of a hasty stylelessness in some of those long poems which the world has been raving about in the last year or two. His line in The Everlasting Mercy. And yet men ask, are barmaids chaste? is a masterpiece of inexpertness, and the couplet, the Boston turned, I'll give you a thick ear. Do it? I didn't. Get to hell from here. It's like a Sunday school teacher's lame attempt to repeat a blasphemous story. Mr. Maysfield, on the other hand, is, we always feel, wrestling with language. If he writes in a hurry, it is not because he is indifferent but because his soul is full of something that he is eager to express. He does not gabble. He is, as it were, 
a man stammering out a vision. So vastly greater are his virtues than his faults as a poet, indeed, that the latter would only be worth the briefest mention if it were not for the danger of their infecting other writers who envy him his method but do not possess his conscience. One cannot contemplate with equanimity the prospect of a Macefield school of poetry with all Mr. Mayfield's ineptitudes and none of his genius. Criticism, however, it is to be feared, is a fight for a lost cause if it essays to prevent the founding of schools upon the faults of good writers. Criticism will never kill the copyist. Nothing but the end of the world can do that. Still, whatever the practical results of his work may be, it is the function of the critic to keep the standard of writing high, to insist that the authors shall write well, even if his own sentences are like torn strips of newspaper for commonness. He is the enemy of sloppiness in others, especially of that airy sloppiness which so often nowadays runs to four or five hundred pages in a novel. It was amazing to find with what airiness a promising writer like Mr. Compton Mackenzie gave us some years ago, Sinister Street, a novel containing thousands of sentences that only seemed to be there because he had not thought it worth his while to leave them out, and thousands of others that seemed to be mere hurried attempts to express realities upon which he was unable to spend more time. Here is a writer who began literature with the sense of words and who is declining into a mere sense of wordiness. It is simply another instance of the ridiculous rush of writing that is going on all about us, a rush to satisfy a public which demands quantity rather than quality in its books. I do not say that Mr. Mackenzie consciously wrote down to the public, but the atmosphere obviously affected him. Otherwise, he would hardly have let his book go out into the world till he had rewritten it, till he had separated his necessary from his unnecessary sentences and given his conversations the tones of reality. There is no need, however, for criticism to lash out indiscriminately at all her writing. There are a multitude of books turned out every year which make no claim to be literature. The thrillers, for example, of Mr. Phillips Oppenheim and of that capable firm of Theotonis, Coralie Stanton, and Heath Hoskin. I do not think literature stands to gain anything, even though all the critics in Europe were suddenly to assail this kind of writing. It is a frankly commercial affair, and we have no more right to demand style from those who live by it than from the authors of the weather reports in the newspapers. Often one notices, when the golden youth fresh from college and the reading of Shelley in Anatole France commences literary critic, he begins damning the sensational novelists as though it were their business to write like Jane Austen. This is a mere waste of literary standards, which need only to be applied to what pretends to be literature. That is why one is often impelled to attack really excellent writers, like Sir Arthur Quiller Couch or Mr. Galsworthy, as one would never dream of attacking, say, Mr. William Le Creux. To attack Sir Arthur Quiller Couch is indeed a form of appreciation, for the only just criticism that can be leveled against him is that his later work does not seem to be written with that singleness of imagination and that deliberate rightness of phrase which made knots and crosses and the ship of stars books to be kept beyond the end of the year. If one attacks Mr. Galsworthy, again, it is usually because one admires his best work so wholeheartedly that one is not willing to accept from him anything but the best. One cannot, however, be content to see the author of The Man of Property dropping the platitudes and the false fancifulness of the end of tranquility. It is the false pretenses in literature which criticism must seek to destroy. Recognizing Mr. Galsworthy's genius for the realistic representation of men and women, 
it must not be blinded by that genius to the essential second-rateness and sentimentality of much of his presentation of ideas. He is a man of genius in the black humility with which he confesses strength and weakness through the figures of men and women. He achieves too much of a pulpit complacency, therefore of condescendingness, therefore of falseness to the deep intimacy of good literature, when he begins to moralize about time and the universe. One finds the same complacency, the same condescendingness, in a far higher degree in the essays of Mr. A.C. Benson. Mr. Benson, I imagine, began writing with a considerable literary gift, but his later work seems to me to have little in it but a good man's pretentiousness. It has the air of going profoundly into the secrecy of love and joy and truth, but it contains hardly a sentence that would waken a ruffle on the surface of the shallowest spirit. It is not of the literature that awakens indeed, but of the literature that puts to sleep, and that is always a danger, unless it is properly labeled and recognizable. Sleeping drafts may be useful to help a sick man through a bad night, but one does not recommend them as a cure for ordinary healthy thirst. Nor will Mr. Benson escape just criticism on the score of his manner of writing. He's an absolute master of the odious word, the superfluous sentence. He pours out pages as easily as a bird sings, but alas, it is a clockwork bird in this instance. He lacks the true innocent absorption in his task, which makes happy writing and happy reading. It is not always the authors, on the other hand, whose pretenses it is the work of criticism to destroy. It is frequently the wild claims of the partisans of an author that must be put to the test. This sort of pretentiousness often happens during booms, when some author is talked of as though he were the only man who had ever written well. How many of these booms have we had in recent years? Booms of Wilde, of Singh, of Dunn, of Dostoevsky. On the whole, no doubt, they do more good than harm. They create a vivid enthusiasm for literature that affects many people who might not otherwise know that to read a fine book is as exciting an experience as going to a horse race. Hundreds of people would not have the courage to sit down to read a book like The Brothers Karamazov unless they were compelled to do so as a matter of fashionable duty. On the other hand, booms more than anything else make for false estimates. It seems impossible with many people to praise Dostoevsky without saying that he is greater than Tolstoy or Turgenev. Oscar Wilde enthusiasts again invite us to rejoice, not only over that pearl of triviality, the importance of being earnest, but over a blaze of paste jewelry like Salome. Similarly, Don worshippers are not content to ask us to praise Don's gifts of fancy, analysis, and idiosyncratic music. They insist that we shall also admit that he knew the human heart better than Shakespeare. It may be all we like sheep have gone astray in this kind of literary riot. And so long as the exaggeration of a good writer's genius is an honest personal affair, one resents it no more than one resents the large nose or the bandy legs of a friend. It is when men begin to exaggerate in herds, to repeat like a lesson learned the enthusiasm of others, that the boom becomes offensive. It is as if men who had not large noses were to begin to pretend that they had, or as if men whose legs were not bandy were to pretend that they were, for fashion's sake. Insincerity is the one entirely hideous artistic sin, whether in the creation or in the appreciation of art. The man who enjoys reading the Family Herald and admits it is nearer a true artistic sense than the man who is bored by Henry James and denies it. Though perhaps hypocrisy is a kind of homage paid to art as well as to virtue. 
Still, the affectation of literary rapture offends like every other affectation. It was the chorus of imitative rapture over Singh a few years ago that helped most to bring about a speedy reaction against him. Singh was undoubtedly a man of fine genius, the genius of gloomy comedy and ironic tragedy. His mind delved for strangeness in speech and imagination among people whom the new age had hardly touched, and his discoveries were sufficiently magnificent to make the eyes of any lover of language brighten. His work showed less of the mastery of life, however, than of the mastery of a thing. It was a curious byworld of literature, a little literature of death's heads, and therefore no more to be mentioned with the work of the greatest than the stories of Vie de Liadam. Unfortunately, some disturbances in Dublin at the first production of The Playboy turned the play into a battle cry, and the artist, headed by Mr. Yates, used sing to belabor the Philistinism of the mob. In the excitement of the fight, they were soon talking about Singh as though Dublin had rejected a Shakespeare. Mr. Yates even used the word Homeric about him, surely the most inappropriate word it would be possible to imagine. Before long, Mr. Yates' enthusiasm had spread to England, where people who ignored the real magic of Singh's work, as it is to be found in Riders to the Sea, in the shadow of the Glen, and the well of the saints, went into ecstasies over the inferior playboy. Such a boom meant not the appreciation of Singh, but a glorification of his more negligible work. It was almost as if we were to boom Swinburne on the score of his later political poetry. Criticism makes for the destruction of such booms. I do not mean that the critic has not the right to fling about superlatives like any other man. Criticism, in one aspect, is the art of flinging about superlatives finely, but they must be personal superlatives, not boom superlatives. Even when they are showered on an author who is the just victim of a boom, and on a reasonable estimate, at least 50% of the booms have some justification. They are as unbeautiful as rotten apples, unless they have this personal kind of honesty. It may be thought that an attitude of criticism like this may easily sink into Pharisaism, a sort of superior person aloofness from other people. And no doubt the critic, like other people, needs to beat his breast and pray, God be merciful to me, a critic. On the whole, however, the critic is far less of a professional fault finder than is sometimes imagined. He is, first of all, a virtue finder a singer of praise. He is not concerned with getting rid of the dross except in so far as it hides the gold. In other words, the destructive side of criticism is purely a subsidiary affair. None of the best critics have been men of destructive minds. They are like gardeners whose business is more with the flowers than with the weeds. If I may change the metaphor, the whole truth about criticism is contained in the Eastern proverb, which declares that love is the net of truth. It is as a lover that the critic, like the lyric poet and the mystic, will be most excellently symbolized. End of section 38. Section 39 of The Art of Letters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley The Art of Letters by Robert Lind Book Reviewing, Part 1 I notice that in Mr. Seeker's Art and Craft of Letters series, no volume on book reviewing has yet been announced. A volume on criticism has been published, it is true, but book reviewing is something different from criticism. It swings somewhere between criticism on the one hand and reporting on the other. When Mr. Arthur Bouchier, a few years ago, in the course of a dispute about Mr. Walkley's criticisms, spoke of the dramatic critic as a dramatic reporter, 
he did a very insolent thing. But there was a certain reasonableness in his phrase. The critic on the press is a news-gatherer as surely as the man who is sent to describe a public meeting or a strike. Whether he is asked to write a report on a play of Mr. Shaw's, or an exhibition of etchings by Mr. Bone, or a volume of short stories by Mr. Conrad, or a speech by Mr. Asquith, or a strike on the Clyde, his function is the same. It is primarily to give an account, a description, of what he has seen or heard or read. This may seem to many people, especially to critics, a degrading conception of a book reviewer's work, but it is quite the contrary. A great deal of book reviewing at the present time is dead matter. Book reviews ought at least to be alive as news. At present, everybody is ready to write book reviews. This is because nearly everybody believes that they are the easiest kind of thing to write. People who would shrink from offering to write poems or leading articles or descriptive sketches of football matches have an idea that reviewing books is something with the capacity for which every man is born, as he is born with the capacity for talking prose. They think it is as easy as having opinions. It is simply making a few remarks at the end of a couple of hours spent with a book in an armchair. Many men and women, novelists, barristers, professors, and others, review books in their spare time, as they look on this as work they can do when their brains are too tired to do anything which is of genuine importance. A great deal of book reviewing is done contemptuously, as though to review books well were not as difficult as to do anything else well. This is perhaps due in some measure to the fact that, for the amount of hard work it involves, book reviewing is one of the worst-paid branches of journalism. The hero of Mr. Beresford's new novel, The Invisible Event, makes an income of £250 a year as an outside reviewer, and it is by no means every outside reviewer who makes as much as that from reviewing alone. It is not that there is not an immense public which reads book reviews. Mr. T.P. O'Connor showed an admirable journalistic instinct when 20 years or so ago he filled the front page of the Weekly Sun with a long book review. The sale of the Times Literary Supplement, since it became a separate publication, is evidence that for good or bad, many thousands of readers have acquired the habit of reading criticism of current literature. But I do not think that the mediocre quality of most book reviewing is due to low payment. It is a result, I believe, of a wrong conception of what a book review should be. My own opinion is that a review should be, from one point of view, a portrait of a book. It should present the book instead of merely presenting remarks about the book. In reviewing, portraiture is more important than opinion. One has to get the reflection of the book and not a mere comment on it down on paper. Obviously, one must not press this theory of portraiture too far. It is useful chiefly as a protest against the curse of comment. Many clever writers, when they come to write book reviews, instead of portraying the book, waste their time in remarks to the effect that the book should never have been written, and so forth. That, in fact, is the usual attitude of clever reviewers when they begin. They are so horrified to find that Mr. William Lecure does not write like Dostoevsky, and that Mrs. Florence Barclay lacks the grandeur of Aeschylus, that they run amuck among their contemporaries with something of the furious destructiveness of Don Quixote on his adventures. It is the noble intolerance of youth, but how unreasonable it is. Suppose a portrait painter were suddenly to take his sitter by the throat on the ground that he had no right to exist. One would say to him that this was not his business. His business is to take the man's existence for granted and to paint him until he becomes in a new sense alive. If he is worthless, paint his worthlessness, but do not merely comment on it. There is no reason why a portrait should be flattering but it should be a portrait. It may be a portrait in the grand matter, or a portrait in caricature. If it expresses its subject honestly and delightfully, that is all we can ask of it. A critical portrait of a book by Mr. Lequeux may be amazingly alive. A censorious comment can only be dull. Mr. Hubert Bland was at one time an almost ideal portrait painter of commonplace novels. He obviously liked them, as the caricaturist likes the people in the street. The novels themselves might not be readable, but Mr. Bland's reviews of them were. 
he could reveal their characteristics in a few strokes which would tell you more of what you wanted to know about them than a whole dictionary of adjectives of praise and blame one could tell at a glance whether the book had any literary value whether it was worth turning to as a stimulant whether it was even intelligent of its kind one would not like to see mr bland's method too slavishly adopted by reviewers it was suitable only for portraying certain kinds of books but it is worth recalling as the method of a man who dealing with books that were for the most part insipid and worthless made his reviews delightfully alive as well as admirably interpretive the comparison of a review to a portrait fixes attention on one essential quality of a book review a reviewer should never forget his responsibility to his subject he must allow nothing to distract him from his main task of setting down the features of his book vividly and recognizably one may say this even while admitting that the most delightful book reviewers of modern times for the literary causeries of anatole france may fairly be classified as book reviews were the revolt of an escaped angel against the limitations of a journalistic form but anatole france happens to be a man of genius and genius is a justification of any method in the hands of a pinchbeck anatole france how unendurable the review conceived as a causerie would become anatole france observes that all books in general and even the most admirable seem to me infinitely less precious for what they contain than for what he who reads them puts into them that in a sense is true but no reviewer ought to believe it his duty is to his author whatever he puts into him is a subsidiary matter the critic says anatole france again must imbue himself thoroughly with the idea that every book has as many different aspects as it has readers and that a poem like a landscape is transformed in all the eyes that see it in all the souls that conceive it here he gets nearer the idea of criticism as portraiture and practically every critic of importance has been a portrait painter in this respect saint bove is at one with macaulay pater with matthew arnold anatole france occasionally with henry james they may portray authors rather than books artists rather than their work but this only means that criticism as its highest is a study of the mind of the artist as reflected in his art clearly if the reviewer can paint the portrait of an author he is achieving something better even than the portrait of a book but what at all costs he must avoid doing is to substitute for a portrait of one kind or another the rag bag of his own moral political or religious opinions it is one of the most difficult things in the world for anyone who happens to hold strong opinions not to make the mind of shakespeare himself a pulpit from which to roar them at the world reviewers with theories about morality and religion can seldom be induced to come to the point of portraiture until they have enjoyed a preliminary half column of self-explanation in their eyes a review is a moral essay rather than an imaginative interpretation in dissenting from this view one is not pleading for a race of reviewers without moral or religious ideas or even prepossessions one is merely urging that in a review as in a novel or a play the moral should be seated at the heart instead of sprawling all over the surface in the well-worn phrase it should be implicit not explicit undoubtedly a rare critic of genius can make an interesting review article out of a statement of his own moral and political ideas but that only justifies the article as an essay not as a review to many reviewers especially in the bright days of youth it seems an immensely more important thing to write a good essay than a good review and so it is but not when a review is wanted it is a far far better thing to write a good essay about america than a good review of a book on america but the one should not be substituted for the other if one takes up a review of a book on america by mr wells or mr bennett it is in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred in order to find out what the author thinks not what the reviewer thinks if the reviewer begins with a paragraph of general remarks about america or worse still about some abstract thing like liberty he is almost invariably wasting paper 
I believe it is a sound rule to destroy all preliminary paragraphs of this kind. They are detestable in almost all writing, but most detestable of all in book reviews, where it is important to plunge all at once into the middle of things. I say this, though there is an occasional book reviewer whose preliminary paragraphs I would not miss for worlds. But one has even known book reviewers who wrote delightful articles, though they made scarcely any reference to the books under review at all. To my mind, nothing more clearly shows the general misconception of the purpose of a book review than the attitude of the majority of journalists to the quotational review. It is the custom to despise the quotational review, to dismiss it as mere gutting. As a consequence, it is generally very badly done. It is done as if under the impression that it does not matter what quotations one gives, so long as one fills the space. One great paper lends support to this contemptuous attitude towards quotational criticism by refusing to pay its contributors for space taken up by quotations. A London evening newspaper was once guilty of the same folly. A reviewer on the staff of the latter confessed to me that to the present day he finds it impossible, without an effort, to make quotations in a review because of the memory of those days when to quote was to add to one's poverty. Despised work is seldom done well, and it is not surprising that it is almost more seldom that one finds a quotational review well done than any other sort. Yet how critically illuminating a quotation may be, there are many books in regard to which quotation is the only criticism necessary. Books of memoirs and books of verse, the least artistic as well as the most artistic of forms of literature, both lend themselves to it. To criticize verse without giving quotations is to leave one largely in ignorance of the quality of the verse. The selection of passages to quote is at least as fine a test of artistic judgment as any comment the critic can make. In regard to books of memoirs, gossip, and so forth, one does not ask for a test of delicate artistic judgment. Books of this kind should simply be rummaged for entertaining news. To review them well is to make an anthology of, in a wide sense, amusing passages. There is no other way to portray them. And yet, I have known a very brilliant reviewer to take a book of gossip about the German court, and instead of quoting any of the numerous things that would interest people, fill half a column with abuse of the way in which the book was written, of the inconsequence of the chapters, of the second-handedness of many of the anecdotes. Now, I do not object to any of these charges being brought. It is well that made books should not be palmed off on the public as literature, on the other hand, a mediocre book, from the point of view of literature or history, is no excuse for a mediocre review. No matter how mediocre a book is, if it is on a subject of great interest, it usually contains enough vital matter to make an exciting half-column. Many reviewers despise a bad book so heartily that instead of squeezing every drop of interest out of it as they ought to do, they refrain from squeezing a single drop of interest out of it they are frequently people who suffer from anecdotophobia. Scorn not the anecdote is a motto that might be modestly hung up in the heart of every reviewer. After all, Montaigne did not scorn it, and there is no reason why the modern journalist should be ashamed of following so respectable an example. One can quite easily understand how the gluttony of many publishers for anecdotes has driven writers with a respect for their intellect into revolt. But let us not be unjust to the anecdote because it has been cheapened through no fault of its own. We may be sure of one thing. A review, a review at any rate of a book of memoirs or any similar kind of non-literary book, which contains an anecdote, is better than a review which does not contain an anecdote. If an anecdotal review is bad, it is because it is badly done not because it is anecdotal. This, one might imagine, is too obvious to require saying, but many men of brains go through life without ever being able to see it. End of section 39、Sorry. Section 40 of The Art of Letters This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Amelia Chesley. The Art of Letters by Robert Lind. Book Reviewing, Part 2. One of the chief virtues of the anecdote is that it brings the reviewer down from his generalizations to the individual instances. Generalizations mixed with instances make a fine sort of review, but to flow on for a column of generalizations without ever pausing to light them into life with instances, concrete examples, anecdotes, is to write not a book review, but a sermon. Of the two, the sermon is much the easier to write. It does not involve the trouble of constant reference to one's authorities. Perhaps, however, someone with practice in writing sermons will argue that the sermon without instances is as somniferous as the book review with the same want. Whether that is so or not, the book review is not, as a rule, the place for abstract argument. Not that one wants to shut out controversy. There is no pleasanter review to read than a controversial review. Even here, however, one demands portrait as well as argument. It is, in nine cases out of ten, a waste of time to assail a theory when you can portray a man. It always seems to me to be hopelessly wrong for the reviewer of biographies, critical studies, or books of a similar kind to allow his mind to wander from the main figure in the book to the discussion of some theory or other that has been incidentally put forward. Thus, in a review of a book on Stevenson, the important thing is to reconstruct the figure of Stevenson, the man and the artist. This is much more vitally interesting and relevant than theorizing on such questions as whether the writing of prose or of poetry is the more difficult art, or what are the essential characteristics of romance. These and many other questions may arise, and it is the proper task of the reviewer to discuss them so long as their discussion is kept subordinate to the portraiture of the central figure but they must not be allowed to push the leading character in the whole business right out of the review. If they are brought in at all, they must be brought in like moral sentiments, inoffensively by the way. In pleading that a review should be a portrait of a book to a vastly greater degree than it is a direct comment on the book, I am not pleading that it should be a mere bald summary. The summary kind of review is no more a portrait then is the Scotland Yard description of a man wanted by the police. Portraiture implies selection and a new emphasis. The synopsis of the plot of a novel is as far from being a good review as is a paragraph of general comment on it. The review must justify itself not as a reflection of dead bones, but by a new life of its own. Further, I am not pleading for the suppression of comment and if need be, condemnation. But either to praise or condemn without instances is dull. Neither the one thing nor the other is the chief thing in the review. They are the crown of the review, but not its life. There are many critics to whom condemnation of books they do not like seems the chief end of man. They regard themselves as engaged upon a holy war against the devil and his works. Horace complained that it was only poets who were not allowed to be mediocre. The modern critic, I should say the modern critic of the censorious kind, not the critic who looks on it as his duty to puff out meaningless superlatives over every book that appears, will not allow any author to be mediocre. The war against mediocrity is a necessary war, but I cannot help thinking that mediocrity is more likely to yield to humor than to contemptuous abuse. Apart from this, it is the reviewer's part to maintain high standards for work that aims at being literature, rather than to career about like a destroying angel among books that have no such aim. Criticism, Anatole France has said, is the record of the soul's adventures among masterpieces. Reviewing, alas, is for the most part the record of the soul's adventures among books that are the reverse of masterpieces. What then are his standards to be? Well, a man must judge linen as linen, cotton as cotton, and shoddy as shoddy. It is ridiculous to denounce any of them for not being silk. To do so is not to apply high standards so much as to apply wrong standards. One has no right as a reviewer to judge a book by any standard save that which the author aims at reaching. As a private reader, 
one has the right to say of a novel by mr joseph hawking for instance this is not literature this is not realism this does not interest me this is awful i do not say that these sentences can be fairly used of any of mr hawking's novels i merely take him as an example of a popular novelist who would be bound to be condemned if judged by comparison with flaubert or meredith or even mr galsworthy but the reviewer is not asked to state whether he finds mr hawking readable so much as to state the kind of readableness at which mr hawking aims and the measure of his success in achieving it it is the reviewer's business to discover the quality of a book rather than to keep announcing that the quality does not appeal to him not that he need conceal the fact that it has failed to appeal to him but he should remember that this is a comparatively irrelevant matter he may make it as clear as day indeed he ought to make it as clear as day if it is his opinion that he regards the novels of charles garvis as shoddy but he ought also to make it clear whether they are the kind of shoddy that serves its purpose is this to lower literary standards i do not think so for in cases of this kind one is not judging literature but popular books those to whom popular books are anathema have a temperament which will always find it difficult to fall in with the limitations of the work of a general reviewer the curious thing is that this intolerance of easy writing is most generally found among those who are most opposed to intolerance in the sphere of morals it is as though they had escaped from one sort of puritanism into another personally i do not see why if we should be tolerant of the breach of a moral commandment we should not be equally tolerant of the breach of a literary commandment we should gently scan not only our brother man but our brother author the aesthete of to-day however will look kindly on adultery but show all the harshness of a pilgrim father in his condemnation of a split infinitive i cannot see the logic of this if irregular and commonplace people have the right to exist surely irregular and commonplace books have a right to exist by their side the reviewer however is often led into a false attitude to a book not by its bad quality but by some irrelevant quality some underlying moral or political idea he denounces a novel the moral ideas of which offend him without giving sufficient consideration to the success or failure of the novelist in the effort to make his characters live similarly he praises a novel with the moral ideas of which he agrees without reflecting that perhaps it is as a tract rather than as a work of art that it has given him pleasure both the praise and blame which have been heaped upon mr kipling are largely due to appreciation or dislike of his politics the imperialist finds his heart beating faster as he reads the english flag and he praises mr kipling as an artist when it is really mr kipling as a propagandist who has moved him the anti-imperialist on the other hand is often led by detestation of mr kipling's politics to deny even the palpable fact that mr kipling is a very brilliant short storyteller it is for the reviewer to raise himself above such prejudices and to discover what are mr kipling's ideas apart from his art and what is his art apart from his ideas the relation between one and the other is also clearly a relevant matter for discussion but the confusion of one with the other is fatal in the field of morals we are perhaps led astray in our judgments even more frequently than in matters of politics mr shaw's plays are often denounced by critics whom they have made laugh till their sides ached and the reason is that after leaving the theatre the critics remember that they do not like mr shaw's moral ideas in the same way it seems to me a great deal of the praise that has been given to mr d h lawrence as an artist ought really to be given to him as a distributor of certain moral ideas that he has studied wonderfully one aspect of human nature that he can describe wonderfully some aspects of external nature i know but i doubt whether his art is fine enough or sympathetic enough to make enthusiastic any one who differs from the moral attitude as it may be called of his stories this is the real test of a work of art 
has it sufficient imaginative vitality to capture the imagination of artistic readers who are not in sympathy with its point of view? The Book of Job survives the test. It is a book to the spell of which no imaginative man could be indifferent, whether Christian, Jew, or atheist. Similarly, Shelley is read and written about with enthusiasm by many who hold moral, religious, and political ideas directly contrary to his own. Mr. Kipling's recessional, with its somber, imaginative glow, its recapturing of Old Testament prides and fears, commands the praise of thousands to whom much of the rest of his poetry is the abominable thing. It is the reviewer's task to discover imagination even in those who are the enemies of the ideas he cherishes. Insofar as he cannot do this, he fails in his business as a critic of the arts. It may be said in answer to all this, however, that to appeal for tolerance in book reviewers is not necessary. The press is already overcrowded with laudations of commonplace books. Not a day passes, but at least a dozen books are praised as having not a dull moment, being readable from cover to cover, and as reminding the reviewer of Stevenson, Meredith, Oscar Wilde, Paul de Kock, and Jane Austen. That is not the kind of tolerance which one is eager to see. That kind of review is scarcely different from a publisher's advertisement. Besides, it usually sins in being a mere summary and comment, or even comment without summary. It is a thoughtless scattering of acceptable words, and is as unlike the review conceived as a portrait, as is the hostile kind of commentary review which I have been discussing. It is generally the comment of a lazy brain, instead of being, like the other, the comment of a clever brain. Praise is the vice of the commonplace reviewer, just as censoriousness is the vice of the more clever sort. Not that one wishes either praise or censure to be stinted. One is merely anxious not to see them misapplied. It is a vice, not a virtue, of reviewing, to be lukewarm either in the one or the other. What one desires most of all in a reviewer, after a capacity to portray books, is the courage of his opinions, so that whether he is face to face with an old reputation like Mr. Conrad's, or a new reputation like Mr. Mackenzie's, he will boldly express his enthusiasms and his dissatisfactions without regard to the estimate of the author, which is, for the moment, in the air. What seems to be wanted, then, in a book reviewer, is that without being servile he should be swift to praise, and that without being censorious he should have the courage to blame. While tolerant of kinds in literature, he should be intolerant of pretentiousness. He should be less patient, for instance, of a pseudo-Milton than of a writer who frankly aimed at nothing higher than a book of music hall songs. He should be more eager to define the qualities of a book than to heap comment upon comment. If, I hope the image is not too strained, he draws a book from the life, he will produce a better review than if he spends his time calling it names, whether foul or fair. But what of the equipment of the reviewer, it may be asked? What of his standards? One of the faults of modern reviewing seems to me to be that the standards of many critics are derived almost entirely from the literature of the last thirty years. This is especially so with some American critics, who rush feverishly into print with volumes spotted with the names of modern writers as Christmas pudding is spotted with currants. To read them is to get the impression that the world is only a hundred years old. It seems to me that Matthew Arnold was right when he urged men to turn to the classics for their standards. His definition of the classics may have been too narrow, and nothing could be more utterly dead than a criticism which tries to measure imaginary literature by an academic standard, or the rules of Aristotle. But it is only those to whom the classics are themselves dead who are likely to lay this academic dead hand on new literature. Besides, even the most academic standards are valuable in a world in which chaos is hailed with enthusiasm both in art and in politics. But when all is said, the taste which is the essential quality of a critic is something with which he is born. It is something which is not born of reading Sophocles and Plato, and does not perish of reading Miss Marie Corelli. This taste must illuminate all the reviewer's portraits. 
Without it, he had far better be a coach builder than a reviewer of books. It is this taste in the background that gives distinction to a tolerant and humorous review of even the most unambitious detective story. End of section 40 End of the Art of Letters by Robert Lind